live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering ServiceNow Knowledge 2018. Brought to you by ServiceNow. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of ServiceNow Knowledge 18 here in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Dave Vellante. We're joined by Dave Wright. He is the Chief Innovation Officer at ServiceNow. Thanks so much for coming oh, on the program. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. Good to see you again, Dave. Yeah. Good to see you as well. Yeah, you're, you've, you've been around the block. You've been on the Cube a few times. Around the block, bad way of putting it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Chief Innovation Officer, we've had a lot of great new product launches at this show. What are you most excited about and what are you already thinking about when you go back to your office? So I think, I'm, I think what's been What's been interesting to me is the, the different way of engaging now we've got the concept of virtual agent technology. And I, I don't just mean the fact we've got a virtual agent, the fact that it starts to give people alternatives and it gives people alternative ways to come into the system, whether it be through our interface or whether it be through someone else's interface. I start to wonder what will happen going forward as we get more and more bot type technologies out there. How will you how will you have that one interface that works with all those to get the information back at the chain? How will you, how will you almost have a, a single interface that allows you to connect to all these bots and solve your problems? Because the, the benefits kind of twofold. One is the, the bot technology you get from being a customer to coming in and actually doing a request. But the other is you'll eventually be able to take that same technology and apply it to the fulfiller user, so the power user. Because if I'm doing something and I can have an agent that's helping me do it, almost like, a, like the agent assist concept you saw this morning, if I could take that to a next level and have AI running on top of that, then, then I, can make, I can make work easier for the people coming in, but I can actually improve the people that are in the system and make them more effective. So, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, follow up please. I know, I was just going to ask about, about how you get your ideas. So, so you're, you're here, you're, you're interacting with customers, you're seeing how they're using your product. So, so is, it, is it interviewing customers to find out their pain points? Is it, is it really just watching? I mean, you're the chief innovation officer. How do you <laughs> so it's spark a, your own creativity? So it's a really weird answer. I, I get most of it off kids and most of it off my kids. So I can, I can tell you a story. Um, we were in we were in Barnes and Noble the other week, and they had a uh, they had albums in there, like classic twelve inch albums. Coming back, <laughs> and they cost more than they used to. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I called the kids over. I said, "Look, let's let's get educated. This is what I used to use to play music on." And um, now we move to CDs, and then you you guys miss CDs, and this is why you guys buy music. Now I had a, a I've got a twelve year old and a seven year old, and a twelve year old was saying, "Well, well, we don't buy music." And I said, yeah, and I thought, oh no, you don't, you, you rent music. Yeah. And then my youngest daughter said, why would you want to, why, why would you want to own a song forever? <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. We started having a, a, a discussion. <laughs> These are deep, These are deep questions. Yeah, we started having yeah. a discussion, there was a load of kids over having a, a sleepover and they were all eating pizza and, and they were talking about the, the concept of having a job. They said, how do you decide what you want to do for the rest of your life and how do you do that? And, and we were talking about how you do something, you get better, you go to another company, you get better at doing it, you go to another company. And one of them said, oh, it sounds really boring, just like doing the same thing. And then one of them had the best answer. She said, don't you think it's a waste of your time? And I was like, why, why is it a waste of, and she said, because if you're really good at something, why should you just do it for one company? And I was like, oh, so you're going to be a contractor. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what I realized was because because this whole generation don't need to own things, they just need to use things. So they don't need to, they don't need to know how to do something. They can just, they just know they want to do it. And they don't need to know, they don't need to own something. They just need temporary access to it. Then, then it got me thinking when you talk about where could work go to, as to do you get a, a whole concept of the gig economy becoming a gig enterprise? Because we have a lot of people in work who've got all these different skills, but we force them to do one job. And, and it might be that it might be that someone's doing a job, but they've got skills that would be applicable outside of that job, but they never get to use them. So, so have we seen the first generation arrive now, where they expect everything to be task-based, and then it gives you control over your own career, because then you say, well, actually, I'm not good at this, but I can start to bid for low-end work. I, I can say to people, hey, look, I'm only a three on a skills racing, but if if you don't need anything complex, I'll take it because I get to learn. So it's a it's a whole new dynamic, and I think when you 
when you ask where about ideas come from, some of the first stage ideas or the first horizon, I think they come from customers. Some of the second horizon, they come from people who aren't working. It's just trying to imagine how they how they all develop and whereabouts that all goes. So, so you surround yourself with millennials. <laughs> oh, not even millennials. I mean, millennials are kind of free. Yeah, post millennials. I'm, I'm looking for almost almost like the linksters, almost like the the, the people who've who've been born connected. It's definitely a Gen Z thing, but it's beyond millennials. Yeah, I right. think the 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 millennials had a certain expectation around. Um, well, it was a it's kind of a negative connotation, but before they were called millennials, people used to refer to it as the entitlement generation, and it wasn't because they were entitled. It was because they felt they they just got access to everything. So, you know, it's like with it's like with my kids, and they're kind of Gen Z, and one of them is a Linkster. But you never you'd never go to them and say they or they never come to you and say, hey, I want to watch a movie, and you go, great, let's go to Blockbusters, let's rent it. They they expect it to be just available on demand, available real time, and that was what I think the. Um, the kind of millennial generation started, being entitled to access to data. Then I think you went to the unlimited generation where it was everything always connected, no concept of bandwidth. But now I think it's the, the real thing that's changing is the concept of, of ownership. And I think that's where you start to see things like, well, will the car industry ever be the same? Because if you don't need to own a car because you're not driven by the same passions that people who want cars are driven by, it's just a way of communicating. You don't, you don't need a garage on your house. You may as well just park the car somewhere else. It comes when you need it. It can change the way cities are laid out. I mean, there's so many different routes you can go down with this. So how does that innovation, how does that knowledge that you gain get into ServiceNow products and services? So that all comes back then to, to how you, how people are going to face new management dynamics, so how people are going to manage things like IoT devices, how are people going to deal with managing work if it is a task-based economy, how are people going to start to think about not just working in a system of record or not just working in a system of engagements, but how are they going to start to, to build that mesh or that web that links all these different things together? And I think that's where our strength comes. Our strength comes in the ability to be able to, to link systems of records together, to link users with those backend systems, to be able to manage those complex work processes. That's kind of the, the core elements of us. And I think when when you look at what Fred Krasik, when he built the platform and he had the whole workflow engine in there, it is that engine that's kind of the key power to the whole company. I like the metaphor of a, a mesh. Right. Sometimes we talk about a matrix of digital services that becomes ubiquitous beyond, beyond like to, a cloud of remote services is, is really transforming into this right. mesh of digital capabilities yeah. that are everywhere, that do things that you know, clouds don't do. They yeah. sense, they react, they respond, they read, they hear. It's, it's an amazing time that we're entering in innovation. Andy McAfee and, and Eric Brynjolfsson, when they wrote the book, Second Machine Age, talked about, yeah, they talked about Moore's Law, powering innovation, but they also talked about the innovation curve reshaping from going from linear Moore's Law, which we've marched to the cadence of Moore's Law for decades in right. this industry, to reshaping to an exponential curve. And I wonder if you, we could get your thoughts. We've posited that it's a combination of sort of data applying machine intelligence to that data and then, and then leveraging cloud economics at scale is really where the innovation is, is going to come from in the future. What are your thoughts on that? So, so let me try and understand the, the question. So, so you're talking about not actually the way that you've seen the growth from a, a processor perspective, but the way you actually see the growth from a machine learning capability, being able to analyze that data? Yeah, so applying yeah. that layer of machine learning, maybe they use that, met that, that mesh metaphor, right. that top level, you know, you got horizontal technology services, but then there's this new AI layer yeah. on top. And so yeah, data I, is the fuel for that AI. Absolutely, I think it's the, uh, I think people can't even imagine what they can do with that data. People can't even contemplate some of the decisions they can make. And it's, it's when people start to look at things in, in completely different ways, when people, when people start to say, well, if we applied machine learning to a user interface, for example, could we come up with a better user interface? Because now, if we understand how people interact with a system, could we actually build a better system? Or uh, you see people, you see people starting to have this whole butterfly effect around the way that artificial intelligence works. So the the best example I heard was um, I was actually at a convention with a girl called Lulu Chang, and she was she was talking to me about it, but. Um, they were speaking to hospitals and they were talking about self-drive cars and the application of machine learning to being able to help cars drive. 
And they were saying the, the interesting knock-on effect of this was uh, a hospital saying it was going to be a real problem for them having self-drive cars. And she was like, why, why is it going to be a problem? And the problem was that they, if you look across the whole of America, you have about 20 people a day die because they can't get replacement organs. But 37% of the organs come from car crashes. So if you take car crashes out of the equation, so what they were investing in was actually looking at how they did cloning technology for organs. So no one would have ever imagined I am building a self car, right. and this is going to improve cloning technology so much. <laughs> and I think AI is in the same place. Everyone's using it in this such a small area that they don't even see the potential of what they could do with it. They don't, they don't have any concept of what they could be starting to look at and how they could start to spot trends between people. Uh, even, even on a base level, I was speaking to, uh, to one of our customers the other night, and, um, and they managed to put an AI system in place that when they got a call in, of the description of the call, they could, they could work out what the customer satisfaction was going to be. And if it was going to be a bad satisfaction figure, they could preempt that and put different agents that were more skilled on that particular issue. And they said a few years ago, all they were interested in was maybe one day we'll be able to categorize something automatically. But now they can predict how well something's going to be resolved. It's very hard to predict, isn't it? I mean, who would have thought that Alexa would have emerged as one of the best, if not the best, natural language processing system, or that you know, images of cats on the internet would lead to <laughs> facial recognition that one technology. Especially. I mean, yeah. it really yeah. could have never predicted that. So, but because you're such a, a, a clear thinker and a strategic thinker, I want to ask you to make some predictions. I want to run some things by you. You've talked about autonomous vehicles for a while. Do you, do you believe that owning in the future, you know, pick whatever time frame you want, that owning and driving your own car will become the exception? Yeah, I think it'll probably be the people who, well, okay, so I definitely think driving your own car will become the exception. I think some people will always want that sense of ownership until we get to a generation that doesn't. Um, I think there'll always be a hard core of people who do want to own and do want to drive and do want that experience. But I think you've already got the issue where congestions at such a level in most areas, is there any enjoyment out of driving? So I, I love driving, I love sports cars, I, I collect them. But if someone said, hey, you've got two options, you can sit in a high performance sports car to go to LA, or you can sit in a Tesla and it will drive itself and you can read a book. I'm getting in the Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> How about retail? Ripe for disruption. Do you think that large retail stores will essentially, not, not essentially, it's never complete, but will largely go away? I think it depends on the, on the nature of the experience. So I think, for, I think for a lot of goods that are consumable goods, I, I can kind of see that going away. I don't think it'll go away for luxury goods. I don't think it'll go away fully for fashion. I think people always like to look at things and, and understand things and check fits. But for, for some things that are high consumables, maybe even for electronics, yep. I can see those going, or I can see it going for, for things where it's one product, so something like a, a, a shop that just sells sneakers. I, I could see someone could easily offer a range and say, well look, here's what we sell. When you order something, we'll automatically ship you one size up, one size down, or two variations of color, and it'll be a free system to return the ones you don't want. I think, I think the, the, whole, the whole experience of ordering one thing and hoping it works out, I think that'll go away. It'll be a concept of ordering a group of things, or maybe it'll be applying artificial intelligence to say, hey, you've asked for this color, but we know that people who also asked for that color like this color as well. We're going to ship you them both. You see how it goes and send us the one back you I don't like. I like it. Okay, um, let's see. Will machines make better diagnoses than doctors? I've, I've got to say, I think you will get to a point where that'll happen. Especially if it's things where it's image processing, where it's x-ray processing, MRI processing where it's something like uh, perhaps it's mental health, then I don't know, maybe I'd, I'd probably rather have my mental health judged by a person than a questionnaire. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think for things where you're using image recognition or things where you're looking at um, pattern distribution or you're looking at even like virus distribution or virus structure, then I think though, I think those areas, I think you will get to a point where a diagnostic issue is better, but you look at where artificial intelligence is from diagnostics now and you go on Dr. Google and yeah. search for something, you know, everything's, everything, everything finishes with the bottom line or it could be cancer. Yeah, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> what about, will there ever
never be a revolt, you know, in the sense of technology is so pervasive, or, or, and, and people just say, forget it, I'm sick of just being tracked. I'm, I just kind of want to have a human to human connection. Dream and on. It's, <laughs> so are we it's done gone. for? We're it's just, gone. We're, it's, so okay. I was speaking to, I was speaking to, um, to a girl who works for me, uh, Manisha, and she was saying, we were talking on Friday, and she said, hey, I was having a coffee with uh, another girl, Kaz. And like, Manisha's in Seattle and, and uh, Cass is in San Francisco. And I said, oh, was she in Seattle or were you in San Francisco? And, and Manisha's a lot younger than me. And she went, well, no, we weren't in the same room. <laughs> we were just like doing it over video. It was like a virtual coffee. And I was like, what, so you both get coffee and sit and have a conversation? She's like, oh, yeah. I was like, oh. Uh, all right, I got one I'm more. Okay, I got one okay, more. Okay, let's hear it, let's hear it. All right, uh, last one. This is great. I love, thanks for playing along. I know, this is fun. <laughs> Financial services is an industry that really hasn't been disrupted. Do you, do you feel like the banks will lose control, the major banks will lose control of, of, of payment systems? Well, I think there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of conversations now around how much those payment systems open up. Because if you, let's say you do a transaction with Amazon or you do a transaction with Google, how hard would it be for every transaction to be done that way? So rather than, if you're setting up a, a, a payment for, I don't know, gas bills or a car loan payments, Rather than give your bank details, why not give your PayPal details or your, your Amazon account details or your Google details? That could be, that could reduce all the banking transactions down to one interface. I think that could happen. I think you could get, well obviously you're already seeing the rise of blockchain and I'm, I'm not a blockchain expert. I, I'm itching to find a use case for us with blockchain but I can't find Money. it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for direct transactions, if, if both sources can trust each other, then yeah, that direct transaction between those two sources, I think that's completely possible. I think there's also, there's also areas where, you've seen it happen in the past where banking faces issues from retail coming into banking, so sometimes you'll get the big supermarket chains, especially in Europe, they'd say, okay, you're going to get Sainsbury's bank or you're going to get Tesco's bank, because they've got all that customer loyalty, they've got people they can give discounts to if they bank with them, so they can instantly bring if you bought, if you said to your banking, if you said to your shopping account base, hey, if you bank with me, we'll give you $20 a week off your grocery shopping. You could probably bring 10 million customers straight away. So I think banking's challenge from other industries that want to get into it, from places where you'll actually go and do e-transactions now, and from places where you'll just go and order stuff online, you could, you could filter all that through one place. I think there'll still always be the commercial side of banking, there's still always going to be the stocks and bonds, there's still going to be the wealth management, but perhaps for transactional banking, you could start to see a decline. Fantastic, thank okay. you. Yeah, I, I love this futurist talk, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. All right, Dave. thanks for having me, always a pleasure. Great to see you. We will have more from ServiceNow Knowledge 18 and theCUBE's live coverage just after this. Thank <laughs> you.